Um, <clears throat> so we're going to be together till for two and a half hours uh, now. So um, uh, till uh, five o'clock, right? Um, so the first part, um, I'm going to uh, be be talking, and then that will be followed by a tutorial. Um, in which case. Uh, We'll be looking at your infrastructure plans, and I'll be commenting on them. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I wanted to uh, provide here a, um, a discussion on a topic that we already hit in the greatest hits. Um, you'll recall with the greatest hits, I'm very quickly hitting a topic that I'll be coming back around to in many cases later in the semester. And, and there's a topic that needs to be uh, embarked on very early that is especially important to perform early and that's risk management. Now <clears throat> given um, given the limited time today as well to cover it and the fact that we've covered a lot of essentials together in the first part of the class I wanted to to first focus on a quite specific component of, of uh, risk management which is um, designing for testability. As time allows I'll proceed from this to the more general discussion of risk management issues um, uh, in, the, in the later parts of, of today's lecture. If we don't get to that, you've already heard the basic coverage uh, from the, the, the first few days of class. Um, <clears throat> so I talk about designing for testability as an aspect of, of risk management in the sense that it allows for managing, for addressing for mitigating a key risk. When we talk about mitigation, risk mitigation as compared to risk to contingency planning, what are we talking about with mitigation? <coughs> I covered it in the first few days of class. Anyone remember? Preventive action. It's preventive. It's preventive either in lowering the probability that it occurs or the impact it has if it occurs. Risks are uncertainties. They're uncertainties with consequences. And uh, there's two ways we can mitigate them. One is lower the, the, the risk of it happening in the first place, the probability of it happening, I should say. And the second is, if it does happen, have it have less impact. Um, <clears throat> in this case, we're lowering the probability will be, uh, will be hurt by a bug. And in fact, addressing if it does happen, if we have to fix a bug and iterate, the ability to, to spot any issues um, that may have been introduced by that fix, okay? Um, <clears throat> testability is a topic that focuses on the challenge of making, a, of allowing a program to be tested readily. And we talked in a previous session about features that help, help a program be easier to test. Um, <clears throat> Uh, one of them, for example, is presence of comments or use of assertions or the uh, use of uh, clear variable naming, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the presence of code in small functions so you can test each function separately rather than having a big hairy set of code where you can't really test what's going on in the middle easily. Um, and it turns out there's many aspects of testing a program well, and there's things we can do. When we build the program, they'll make it really e e a lot easier to test. Um, those are just some of many ways. Um, it turns out that things that make a program easier to test often make it easier to debug. Amongst other things, they clue you in to what particular thing may be going wrong earlier. Remember, debugging is going from a failure to an observed failure to a fault. So they're discovering the underlying problem. And that's often easier to do if you have the capacity to quickly check things and to uh, intercept the code in certain places, et cetera. All of you folks learned GDB, I think, in 2.14. That's right, is that right? Do you remember GDB, debugging C code? Yeah. Long time ago, galaxy far away. Um, so, in GDB, do you remember how you could set breakpoints, right? Yeah. One of the most common areas to set breakpoints is what? Um, the report. Yeah. The, the loops. Yeah, okay, so you can do it with loops, good. 
but also at the beginning of a function. Often at the beginning of a function, you could see what arguments are passed in, for example. And if code is divided up into a lot of functions, provides you really easy ways of, of intercepting things in certain places. You can, of course, set breakpoints at certain lines of code, but it's often much easier to do at these interfaces, okay? And it turns out functions, well, the presence of, of small functions, lots of them small, will make testing easier or make debugging easier. Um, let's put many little test places at which to get the pulse of the system, see what's going on, see if something is off when chasing down a bug or when first discovering it. <clears throat> so I've mentioned many of these things before, um, uh, just now and earlier, assertions, comments, good naming, logging, etc. cetera. Um, logging is a particularly important one. Um, logging not only at one level, but at multiple levels. Um, and we're gonna also talk about these things called test hooks and harnesses and drivers, um, as well as stubs, mocks, and fakes. I've mentioned them before. I wanna drive home some comments by which you'll help appreciate their value and, and um, why they're particularly flexible to use. All this is quite relevant. Uh, for example, uh, there's many frameworks that allow for mocking. Jmark uh, is one of them for Java. Um, Synon is one for JavaScript. Uh, but there's others as well. I believe Nightwatch may support some uh, JavaScript ones as well. So what are these test hooks? Um, the idea behind test hooks is you can build elements of your program that are actually not built to deliver on requirements directly. They're not built to provide features. They're not built to provide you know, greater security or portability of your system. Rather, what they're done, what they're put in place for is to facilitate testing and debugging, okay? And the idea here is to have, look, let's suppose you have a class, and that class provides an interface for use of things that use instances of the class, right? You have methods that you can call. So if you have a class foo, and you create instances of foo, um, there are certain methods you can call on foo, right? Yeah, there's an interface for use of that class. And we'll, we may talk later about some needs for correctness at a later lecture associated with that interface, but basically it's an interface you can call to use instances of the class to deliver on the functionality of the application. But beyond that, sometimes you have foo have certain methods which are not to be used by the major program. They're to be used by tests. Why would you do that? Why would you create these test hooks? Yeah, they improve debuggability and, and uh, help, help in, in, in um, allowing for, for uh, testing and, and sometimes third party integration. Why would you, or how would you do that? What sort of things might you put in these extra functions to, to help with testing. Anyone? Assertions? Yeah, okay, so you might have assertions. So it might check, I'm gonna use a word here. I don't know if it's been introduced in 270 or 370, an invariant of the class has that been talked about. What's an invariant? It's something that's true throughout the end. Yeah, change. that's right. So it's always got to be true about this class. Give me an example of something that might be an invariant. Okay, so what about that key? Doesn't have to change. Okay, okay, it doesn't have to change, okay. But there's generally, a, it's, a, it's gotta be a property of the class. Always an integer, for example. Okay, the, the keys involved are always, that are stored in this map or this, this hash table, they're all integers. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. What, what other, give me another example of one. So I like that one. Uh, something should never be empty. Good. Yeah, this thing should never be empty, or this field variable should never be null. This dictionary should have no null keys associated with it. Dictionary has has got to have at least one key for the set of basic uh, strings. Maybe it's the months of the year. Um, it, you know, nothing in this dictionary should be mapped to null. Um, there should be no repeat entries in an array. 
These are all sort of characteristics that have got to be true, right? An array is always sorted. That's always, it's got to be true. So here with test hooks, we could test those invariants. We could have a test hook whose job it is, test the invariant. And in my test code, to see if things are sane, I call that, right? What's another type of hook I might have to make testing of something easier? Variable check? Mm -hmm. Okay, so sure, check this a variable i is greater than j, for example, right? Or this variable is always greater than zero. Yeah, good, okay. What other things? Well, you could produce a test hook, for example, that might simulate an error condition. You tell the system you've been disconnected, you know, um, and it essentially it tells it, okay, I'm going to an offline state, so you can test it. And yeah, you could turn off your Wi-Fi every time you want to test it, but wouldn't it be nicer if you could just turn it on, turn, you know, disconnect the Wi-Fi it's as if it's disconnected from Wi-Fi in a test and see if it runs through a bunch of paces rather than depending on someone to disconnect it, right? And we, we talked about another, or referred uh, within the past few lectures to another one of these, right? You know, pretend that you're out of memory or pretend your disk is corrupted or pretend your disk is out of space. You could tell it basically to, to pretend these things and, and that's uh, a useful form of, of, uh, of testing. Um, so another thing, in a world of encapsulation, if I say encapsulation, what do I mean by that with respect to a class? The caps is encapsulate data. What does that mean? Anyone? Group together. Okay, group said, I like that. That's part of it, but there's something more than that. How is it? Ah, there you go. So, do you remember, you folks, when you took first year, did you take C? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Are you the last C generation? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. Uh. So you learned about structs. Yeah. yeah. How is a struct different from a class? Typically, how we use it with respect to data. <clears throat> If I store data in a struct, or even int fields in a struct, who can access that? Struct. Okay, well, yeah, I mean, struct, if there were methods, like if I stored a function pointer in there, it could point to a function which would access that. Who else can access it in a struct? Anyone. Anyone, Anyone who has this pointer to a struct can access it, right? That's the difference between structs and classes, isn't it? It's right. Like classes have like you can protect them. Yeah, That's right, they encapsulate the data. And they do that for good reason. Why do they do that? Why do we encapsulate data in a class? Why would you want to encapsulate it? Why would you want to limit the flexibility of other things to access it? Um, so you can't tamper with it. Okay. Okay, there can be some conditions where there's a risk of memory leakage, like something else could set something you don't know to deallocate it, if it allocates so you don't know to deallocate it. But a lot of the reason is, so you don't have code all over the place changing this in a way that makes the program hard to maintain because there's all these different things tangled up. And even more so, it allows the program to evolve. It allows the class to evolve over time to change its internal representation in ways that the rest of the program won't immediately break. Okay, so we change from indicating that it says an int zero or one to indicating it as a bool internally. We realize we don't really need to maintain it as an int. We thought we'd go up to one, two, three, four. We only are gonna ever need zero and one, so we change it to a bool. If, if things throughout the program are counting on that being an int, and are frobbing it directly, we're gonna break things all across the program. By encapsulating it, I can evolve by, by having, it's kind of like this. It's kind of like if you go to FedEx to ship a package, 
You don't need to know the name of the person behind the desk, who's going to be the driver of the truck that takes it to the airport, who's going to be the pilot on the airport. You don't, have, you, don't, you don't need to know all of that or count on all of that. You just count on them getting the package from where it is, you deliver it to where it has to be delivered the next day at, at a certain time, and you don't care about all the details. When we build large systems, that's an important principle that one area of the system shouldn't have to know about all the details of another area. So that's one of the reasons we encapsulate, we hide information. My class has all this internal information, I hide, all I do is provide guarantees as expressed through my interface. My, the, the, the methods, the, what the methods do, I provide specifications, it tells that, and then people can use it. Can use it. Just like it wouldn't be in, in Java's creator's interest to have everyone know how to all the internal structures of each you know java.object and all these different objects provided by built-in java libraries because if everyone were counting on those details if they tried to evolve it to java 9 java 10 java 11 it's going to break your code because they're going to change how these things are represented they want to make them more efficient they want to make them less memory space they want to they do it in a more clever way uh, for, in terms of sharing data or what have you. Um, this, if, if they exposed all that information, it'll be entangled in a way that would break your code. So, so one of the things we have to do in object-oriented programming, though, is, is we have to get around this fact for testing. Because we actually want tests to be able to look inside objects. We want them to say, hey, is this object in a safe state? Is this object in a sane state? Is it in a state that's meaningful? Mm -hmm. Because we need in the test to know, are things correct? So sometimes we'll have hooks that provide tests the way to sort of look inside and see, is this information cached? Do you know what cache is? Cache hits? Where did you learn about caches? 215? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good folks. Okay. So sometimes it's not obvious, right? From a class, is this information cached properly? I just made a request. Does it cache it? I can't tell. You want to provide a test, a way to test that. Because a cache, what's the job, what's the job of a cache? It allows for faster memory. Yeah, it's access. faster. But I can't. Through its observable behavior, other, short of testing how long it takes, it's hard to determine. If I had a test hook, I could just ask, is this thing in the cache? And it says, yes. That doesn't necessarily mean I have to be able to go in and touch its variables. I could just have a method that's a hook saying, is this thing in the cache? The rest of the program doesn't need to know that. The tests sure can benefit by knowing, OK, is this operating properly, right? Um, so another thing is a diagnostic routine. We talked about checking invariance, integrity. Um, it's not necessarily in one class. It could be between classes. Um, uh, the consistency of things, um, making sure that, that this is fully initialized and it's in a good, a good state. And then for some systems, you want ways of driving the application programmatically. Fancy words. What do I mean by driving it programmatically. What do I mean by that? Um, to say, I want to drive the application in a programmatic way. Essentially, like, test it kind of sort of as a user would use it mm -hmm. in, in a way that would be, a, like, recreatable through tests or something like that. Yeah. So it's basically a way to automatically, uh, in an automated way, put it through certain steps. We have a common language for this that's often used. And it may be before your generation that it had this meaning most strongly, but even now it has this application. We script an application, if I say that, does that make sense? What, is, what do I mean that, for example, if I say I can script this browser, what does it mean? Um, tell the browser to do certain things. I can tell the browser to do certain things with what? A certain order. Okay through, begins with C, ends with an E, it has an O and a D before the E. Code. Through code, yeah. 
I can tell the browser, normally I control it through buttons, right? I control it through throbbing and typing and clicking on things. But instead, I can control it through code. Could you imagine that would be useful for testing if I want to test that browser? Yeah, you create like 10,000 tests that test the browser to load different known pages and see if it correctly has the right elements on it, et cetera. You put it through its paces programmatically rather than with people pressing buttons. So whilst you sleep, it can be tested. Sounds like a good proposition, particularly if you're in 332 right now. Right? Okay. Um, and also you can programmatically read the state of it. You could say, hey, what files do you have open? You know, what's, what's the first element, or what's the first line of that file, or what have you. Okay, test hooks, here's some more ones. Enable and disabling logging of certain things. Oh, this is like gold for testing and debugging. <coughs> Why does it help to log for testing and debugging? Because a log can tell you what variables are and you can look back at them later. Yeah. Yeah. So remember, testing tries to discover what? It tries to discover defects or bugs. Yeah. And, and so could a log be useful? Information in a log be useful to know is it working? Yeah. Because you could yeah. feed it a bunch of numbers, for example. Yeah. Set up a log. Yeah. And then set up a log for those numbers and see using both like just visual and like comparison if those numbers are reasonable. Yeah, good. Um, so, moreover, you might look for high-level things like, okay, I entered this information. Is it making a connection to the database to put it into the database? Does it re re return a success? Right? Um, uh, is is the uh, is the amount of logged amount of memory that it has available go up when I load a large amount of stuff or what have you? Or you might log keystrokes commands that are performed memory usage and structure. So if you could log this sort of stuff at a more detailed level or flipping a switch, no recompile at less of a detailed level, you have this tremendous flexibility to kind of zoom in on more detailed stuff when you need to debug at that level or test at that level and go back up uh, to, to higher levels. Um, okay, browsing of internal data um, through a custom UI or a privileged interface. What application do you use almost daily that has a custom UI associated with it? Operating system? Yeah, okay, an operating system. <coughs> some do, some do. Um, Android is a set of developer interfaces. I guess you could say, yes, for Linux, for example, <coughs> you can you can load in the set of symbols that help you um, help you make sense of core dumps and stuff like that. I don't know that it has a debugging, I guess you could say it as a debugging interface. Sure, an operating system, Windows, uh, Linux, <clears throat> at time of boot up, if something goes wrong, you can go into the, to the console, right? You boot up in console mode before the GUI comes up and you can, you can see what's going on, right? Good. Um, what other things have, has a UI? I see it used in this area a lot. <clears throat> this, these set of machines, I'm not pointing at you. Those set of machines. And Garrett's over there, he's using it a ton. What, what is it? A well, browser. Have you, have you folks ever used um, uh, Google Chrome's developer tools? This is a little developer window. You can come up and you can frob the DOM and see what's going on. Yeah? So that's another example of something which has a, a custom UI, right? Um, or you want a thing that will ask, <clears throat> uh, check on the intermediate state of some algorithm. Maybe there's an algorithm that does something really fancy. I'll give you an example. A number of years ago. Have you folks you ever used Click and Go to plan your bus routes around the city? Yeah. Okay, good man. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, first, the first rendition of Click and Go, or the first approximation to it, actually came out of this class many years ago. You folks, I don't know, 
elementary school or something. Um, anyway, they, they would, you'd, you'd type like where you want to go to, where you want to, where you're coming from, where you want to go to, and it would plan a route, okay? And supposedly the route is the best route. It's like fewest transfers in shortest time. How would you test that it's doing the right thing? How would you test something like that? Think about it. Metro was one function that did that. How would you test that? One thing is you, you could have a bunch of known cases, right? Where you figure it out ahead of time, which is, you know. Remember, testing isn't about demonstrating perfection. Testing is about spotting issues as soon as possible. So what thing would be a particularly easy thing to test? Your current location? To? Your current location? Sure. <laughs> get on the bus and get off, right? Um, okay. Or to, a, to the next location on some, some bus line, right? You know, a bus goes right in front of your house. It goes from your current stop to the next stop. And so you, you, you check that. What would be another way to test it? Well, you know something earlier on, for example, you go from your current location to that location any other way and compare it to like walking and if walking is faster somehow. Like well, then you know your function would be really wrong. Okay, so you, you, you have an ex absurd thing. Maybe it's not walking, maybe it's crawling, but right. you have an upper bound. And if it's, if it's saying <coughs> you can't get there in less than 10 hours, you know, um, that, then you're in trouble or you know, two days or something. Well, okay, so look, that might spot some really weird things, right, where it puts you in a perpetual loop. They, at one point, they had their application going in a loop. It would say, like, you know, get on the bus at 23rd Street, take it to university, take it to university at 23rd Street or something. It did a, did a weird, weird thing. Um, um, there also was one where it said, like, get on the bus, get off the bus immediately. Um, get out of there. Um, okay. How about another way to test it? Well, you could put, basically, you could ask, okay, what, what different lines is it looking at? What different route, possible routes is it looking at? And the intermediate to find, how did it find the best route? And you could have it log what the amounts of time were for the different routes, right? And that actually gives you a better sense of what it's considering in the middle of the algorithm. And that could be really useful to know is it considering all the possible routes properly, right? What's, what's another thing you could do? Well, they claim to have a really good algorithm, a really smart algorithm. They applied Mark Kyle's course right out there. Um, uh, he wasn't helping them quite as much as that though. Um, they applied principles from his course to uh, uh, have a, an optimal algorithm for finding the route. What could they compare that to? Um, a brute force algorithm. Brute force algorithm, yeah. And that would be a useful thing to see if it gives the same results as a brute force algorithm. Often brute force algorithms are easy to write, but you don't want to run them regularly. But this would just be during testing you run. Right? You could also test it against like a greedy algorithm to see if it's better than the greedy algorithm. Yeah, yeah, good. Something that's easy to write and therefore is less likely to be buggy itself. Right? Yeah. Um, so, so these are some examples of things that, that you might uh, check. So deliberately cause rare error conditions. These, these are, are really useful things. Um, um, simulate a long delay connection, etc. Logging is good. And there's tons of logging frameworks. Now, in Java, we have Log4j, which is built in to Java. It's a very nice multi-level uh, logging framework. The key thing is to make it multi-level. What do I mean by multi-level? when it comes to logging. What does it mean to be multi-level? Test from uh, like just simple variables to memory conditions. Is that it can be involved. Um, so, so you would test those different things, but it, it's actually not at the heart of what I'm talking about. Yes. Yeah. Is that like the logging in, um, in Java? where it says you the, the class name and then the 
method name and then the line number and then the variable. Okay, that information is good metadata that it will print out like this thing here, right? This is a C++ program, line 20, et cetera, and the time, et cetera. Those are good things, really important things, and they'll be included typically in a log. But when I say multi-level, what do I mean by that? Yeah. Like the back end, the end kernel? Like what, what it's receiving and what it's outputting? Uh, okay, so that multi-platform stuff is actually pretty important for certain types of testing. Like if you folks have a smartphone-based app and it needs to communicate with logic on a server to store that data, you might want to have some way of logging end-to-end -end stuff, right? Like this task starts here, but then it goes to an endpoint which is transmitted to the server socket and then the server handles it and maybe sends a confirmation back. And you'd like to have a single log trail from that. Is it, is it when um, a log Yes. And the, and the successful procedure. Okay, so I think you may be on to this, Jay. So it's like when you log, I don't know if you folks have, have seen this with log4j, you can log at the level of an error, log at the level of a warning, log at the level of info. Oh, so like a hierarchy. It's, of a, logging. it's a hierarchy of logging. What do those, hierarchy, those elements of the hierarchy mean? Like, what is an error compared to info? Well, info is just information about whatever you're looking at, but an error is like a defect, possibly. Okay, so good. And, not good. And why might you want to distinguish between those? Well, if you, if you get an error, it's a lot more important to look at than something like info. Good. Generally. So the, it tells you what to look at. Good, so, so it'll flag it as important. But not only that, with that sort of hierarchical logging, multi-level logging, what can we do? Filter? Yeah, we can basically filter it to only show, when we run the program, only log things of warning level and up in priority. And then run the same program, no, no recompile needed. Maybe we discover an error with that, right? And we look at the log and say, okay, it's probably somewhere in there. Let me, l let, me, let me get more information. And then you log it with info and up. And then you get a swack more of information. Or you log this section of the code with info and up. And you get more information about what that section is doing. Because you know the log is somewhere in the database interface. So you log that side of the code. This is... This is sweet stuff because you get like an internal picture, an x-ray, what's going on in there. It's not complete, but it lets you know, oh, it skipped that step or it never got to this place. Do you have a reason about that in, in debugging, right? It, does it get here? Yeah, it gets to this place in the code. Does it get here? No, it doesn't. Okay, somewhere in the way it's, it, 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 it got, you know, it failed. And then you start zeroing in a where, where where the failure occurs, and then work back from there to where the fault occurs, right? Yeah. Man, um, and the multi-level logging, right? Um, so you might write, uh, write a debug entry or an error entry. The, uh, the details of that differ a little bit between logging frameworks, but the basic idea is you have certain info that's put out with certain levels of priority, and by changing a config file or otherwise specifying a logging level, you can get more information or less information. Hmm? Have you have you used those frameworks before or not yet? Occasionally. Okay. Use them early, use them often. Yeah, it'll be in your interest. Putting me aside, it'll be in your interest to use them throughout your code base. Why is this any better than print, printf or Because you can trace or disable them and they don't print to the console. Yeah, you disable them like that. No recompile needed. You don't have to go through and delete them from your code. And then when you need them again, put them back in. You don't have to go modify your code. You just up it, down it. You could turn it on in debugging. You can turn it on in testing, during testing. What's another thing that this could be really useful for, for besides 
testing and logging. Give me something else this could be really good for, for professional software developers. Why is logging, why might you want, I'll give you a hint, why might you want logging to, to be on within a shipping version of the program? Okay, so you distribute your app. Why do you want logging to be on? Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, well, okay. Bingo. Yeah. So, so if they encounter a program, suppose the program crashes. What will be really valuable to get? The log. The log of what was going on at the time of the crash. Suppose the program encounters an error. You know, it can't write some information to the DB. What will be really useful for Dealing with a support incident, the, the need to sort of, um, you know, deal with this customer complaint is to see the log. Maybe the person ran out of memory on their on their phone. Maybe maybe their phone ran out of storage space. Maybe maybe the connection was interrupted. This would let you see that that logging information. And in fact, in some programs, it's automatically it's automatically placed back to the mothership, so to speak, back to the software development company. How can you do that? Isn't it with like hooking an analytics? Yeah, so you could, you could put a hook basically that when an error occurs, like when an assertion fails, it takes the log and it posts it via HTTP back to the server for the company that published the application, right? So it's like, here's a log, of something that just went wrong in this way. This was the assertion at this line. This is a log of that. Really, really useful. Now, I really like the way that Jesse is talking because these things are like gold for analytics as well. How are people using our app? What sort of programs are they use, or what sort of environments are they using them on? What sort of systems? How old is the oldest version of iOS we see being used or Android? Why, why might you want to use the, know that? What's the distribution of people using Android 4 devices with our app compared to Android 5? Because it can help guide you in future updates or changes. You yeah, know? yeah. Like, can we put in some new functionality that won't work under Android 4, right? So these are useful things. Logging is like gold. It gives you this information. So <coughs> collecting automatic crash reports is really useful. If you're going to do that, you want certain information there. The version of the software, the builds associated with that, the JVM or OS version. Um, you know, if it's third-party software like browser, the line number and file, the error message, ideally uh, a, a log. Uh, you know, complete log about what's going on, right? Um, and if you're doing Android development, there's some really nice tools for getting system logs on an ongoing basis. And you can actually go into the ADB Android debugger and you can basically say, show me log messages being produced live and you can look through them. Okay. Designing for testability, <coughs> logging. Good. Assertions. Great. Good naming. Excellent. Comments. Yes. Some people you'll find in industry say comments are vastly less important when you have good naming because code is self-documented. By reading the names of the function calls, it's clear what the intention is, what it's doing. I would say comments still have some value, but certainly their incremental benefit is, is, is lower in that case. Naming is even more important than, uh, than good, good commenting. But I'll look to both for you. Another broad area where we can increase testability is with fakes, mocks, and stubs. Does anyone remember what what are these things? If, uh, without distinguishing between 
the three of them for the moment. Just big picture. What are these? What is the job of this thing? Aren't they like dummy pieces of code that run in place of actual variables or objects or whatever, so that you can get an idea, so yep. that you can test an object or method without actually using other objects or methods with it? I really like what you're saying. So it, you hit on just key points, Jesse, one after the other. So these are sort of placeholder or stand-in bits of code. They look, they act like a part of the system, but they're actually just fake versions of it. They're actually just doppelgangers. They're kind of um, not the real thing. They're placeholders. And you'll often use them if like class A depends on, an instance of class A depends on, or say a function A depends on calling functions B, C, D, or, or, or calling off to methods within a bunch of different uh, instances. If we would call A, then it would seem that we have to, and we're trying to test A, we'll have to test all these other things. But we want to know is A working, not is A and B and C and D and E, because if something goes wrong, where could it be? If we're testing them all together, A depends on B and C and D and E, and, and each of them can call other things. If, we're, if, if that's the situation and something goes wrong when we call A, where could the error be? Could be in any function. Could be in any of those. Could be in any of B or C or D or E or F, whatever, right? Does that make sense? So to avoid that, to make it clear where the error lies, clearer, we want to be able to test one piece of it without testing the others. Does that make sense? It's the same reason we don't want just hairball big, big code, right? Because touching one thing requires testing the whole thing. We want to divide it up into pieces, each of which can be nicely tested. It's a nice interface, we know what to expect, we give it this, it should give back that. There's lots of other reasons to divide it up into pieces, but that's the compelling one. So, when we test A, we want to be able to test it, sometimes testing B, C, D, to make sure the whole thing hangs together, but sometimes we just want to test A. Mm -hmm. A by itself. So how do we do that? Well, instead of actually calling B, C, D, E, we do what to those? We mock them out, or stub them out, or fake them out. And we'll come to the distinction between these in a moment. Then we can test A, and we don't have to worry we're testing everything else. But how do we do that? I mean, after all, if A depends on B, C, D, E, how can we test A when it depends on these things? So, so maybe it calls B and it depends on the return value of B. It calls C and it requires C to, to compute a random number. How can we test A? I mean, the most naive way would just be to give um, reasonable return value. Exactly. So we fake out we fake out B with something that returns, say, a fixed value. We fake out C with something that returns a random, a random value, right? And and then we can test A. Maybe the true value V would do a lot more work and only then return the value, but at least we we make sure A is working with respect to this fixed value, right? There might be lots of places where it doesn't work with respect to even a fixed value. And we at least we rule those out. Does it guarantee A was going to work perfectly with B, C, D when, when he substituted them in? No, but it rules out a lot of errors, right? Mm. There's another reason, too, that you might do this. Besides just wanting to test A in isolation. What else? What other reason might we want to do this? Like, 
correct the word is, but uncommon situations for the program to go through <coughs> and make them so that they happen frequent. Yeah. Yeah. So you might want to. Oh, that's excellent. So you might want to cause cause this certain situation which takes a long time to reproduce otherwise to occur frequently to make sure when that happens it works properly. That can that can be true. I like that. So instead of being a one out of a million chance that the cache is missed or that we're out of memory or that this certain timeout condition occurs, we can make it happen frequently for the sake of testing. But maybe B is actually not yet written. We want to be able to test A without B being in place. Could that happen? Darn right it could happen. Or B, just, just as Austin said, B might be non-deterministic, or it's slow, or it's difficult to get into the states that we want, right? Um, so we create a substituted version. Maybe we're debugging A, and we don't want to debug B, C, D, E, F. We just want to debug A. So we get them to do, it's, it's like, it's like those things where, you know, you set it up just under very controlled circumstances and you observe, does it work properly under these circumstances, right? Um, now, there's some differences here. Back when I was young, and you folks weren't yet born, we used stubs a lot. Stubs were little bits of code that would do something very particular for a function. They'd return something very simple. They'd do and put in place a very simple thing. More recently, with the advent of object-oriented programming, you have fakes. Fakes are sort of often classes, instances of classes. They're fake instances of the classes. They're instances of a doppelganger. It looks like the class that you're interested in, but it's not actually the full class. And they return typically trivial or identical or random values. It's, it's only the simplest functionality. Where things get more interesting, ladies and gentlemen, are with mocks. Mocks are like fakes with intelligence. They're like smart fakes. So they're typically done at an object level, but they're not just a fake version of it. They're a, a version of it that's, that's savvy. It's a placeholder that's savvy. It, it may check with assertions that certain things are true. It might confirm, for example, it's only called once. This method is only called once. Or this method is never called with a null entry. Um, it can log. It can log to multiple places, for example. Here, it might have extra intelligence. And it will help you debug by making sure that you know, A is called before B, called before C. The methods A, B, and, excuse me, that, that method, you know, B is called before C, is called before D properly. Okay. Um, so these are key points of use. You're, you're you know, uh, unit testing A, you're test, um, and uh, you're, you're testing things, but there's something that's not yet uh, implemented, for example. Maybe you're testing the UI and you don't want the whole rest of the system to work. Or are you seeking to verify a, a, a sequence of interactions here, okay? Um, so for some tests, you might want to connect the GUI, the GUI, to fakes and mocks rather than to the system. Um, so you want it to log behavior. Maybe it, um, uh, it returns dummy values to the UI so you can see what they look like in the UI uh, or what have you. Um, uh, and sometimes you might want to have test harnesses that do simple things and, and, and drive, uh, drive elsewhere. So an example of a platform like this for Java is something called JMOC. You folks were looking some at JavaScript uh, earlier. Not sure if that's still your plan. We'll hear shortly. But with JavaScript, Sinon is a good platform for, it's actually across different platforms for JavaScript mocking, um, for fakes and mocks and hooks. So the idea here is, look, with JMock, 
you can basically state, mock this class out. It looks at the interface for the class, what methods it has, and it adopts similar methods, so it looks like it. And it will create a mock object that matches that interface that you can then call those methods on, right? Um, the beauty is, with JMock, that you can set expectations regarding things. And these expectations basically will get it to check things. So like what order do I make certain calls on or, or when called do this or the minimum and maximum number of times something is, is called. So, so here's, for example, a, uh, a test here. And, uh, you know, I can go and essentially mock out a certain class here as a subscriber and then I can have it interact with different classes for example and confirm that the subscriber has received a message. This is a published subscriber or observer pattern, right? We have a publisher and we have a subscriber here and the subscriber is actually mocked out but we test did it receive a message for example. Um, and uh, did it receive the message that we wanted it to, uh, to send here, okay? Um, uh, so this is the verification. So we're telling it receive a message here, um, the subscriber, and we want to make sure that, um, that in fact the, uh, the message has been, um, been received properly. So here's a set of the expectations that it supports, for example. It allows mocked code to say the argument is equal to a certain value or that it's the same, that, you know, argument I and argument J are the same. Um, it allows it to say, okay, the argument is some value um, uh, of a certain certain uh, kind. I think that's uh, this, this uh, one of here is used in that uh, previous one. It's, I guess it's not one shown. Um, you can say that, okay, um, this, uh, this given instance is not null. So you could say, you know, this value passed to the mock is not null or that it um, uh, returns this, this certain value, in which case it will return a value to the caller equal to a certain, certain value here. Or it will um, uh, return an iterator, for example. So what this allows you to do is to set up mock objects that have certain functionality. They're not merely dumb things to return a fixed value. Rather, they can check things. They can confirm that things are not null or that they are null or that they're the same or that they're equal to a certain value. And that allows it to do something more than that. Alternatively, you can get it to to uh, return, for example, iterators or, or fixed values. So JMock is one of many mocking interfaces. I actually provided in the Moodle site some documentation on Synon because Synon provides a nice mocking interface that uh, is reasonably good for JavaScript and that allows you to mock out objects and, and test against these mocks, okay? So I would like to see mocking as part of your project. I, it makes a system easier to test. It will require a bit of learning on your part, but it will also require, uh, it will also save you time. And it'll save you time in debugging, save you time in testing, and potentially make it easier to start testing things before other parts of the system are working. So, so Jesse can get going with testing even even as Mo is working to, to implement other areas of the system, okay? Designing in for testability um, features that will make it easier to test. Logging, assertions, comments and good naming, stops, uh, stubs, mocks, and fakes, and then where possible, some hooks that will allow testing, okay? Um, okay, so that was, some discussions of testability. Any questions about that? Okay. Okay, let's talk about risk management. Um, there's just a few key things I wanna emphasize here. So I mentioned 
When you use risk, it's uncertainty about some consequences. Okay. Software engineering is filled with risks. Our lives are filled with risks. And having, having a way of dealing with these in a, in a planned fashion, in a way that shields us from some risks, in a way that lets us deal with greater time and flexibility with others is very valuable. These are some of the risks that um, you know, are common. I've, I've mentioned them before, but staff turnover, requirements creep, an overly aggressive schedule, um, disagreement as to, um, as to uh, what the, uh, you know, what's, what's meant in terms of the, uh, the requirements for the project. Um, or people have lower productivity than anticipated. They, they don't keep up as, as much as anticipated with the schedule. These are fairly common types of risks. Well, particularly the, this one and the top three are quite common in, in this class. Um, infighting and poor relationships sometimes as well, learning curve on new platform. Risks uh, abound. And if we don't know we're gonna be hit by them, they can really throw us for a loop unless, unless we do some planning. So risk management here is about, it's an ongoing process of identifying ahead of time, analyzing, thinking about, and having explicit choice with how to handle different types of risks. Okay. Um, and the idea is, look, you know, um, today's risk is tomorrow problem. If we don't attack it, it will attack us. Um, and I argued in the opening days of class that good risk management not merely shields you, it allows you to take on jobs that other people wouldn't be able to take on. It allows you to take on jobs that would throw off other projects. It allows you to deliver as a first mover advantage, with first mover advantage in areas where other people can't. Um, so it allows avoiding many problems or resilient to those problems that, that comes up. It bounds how uncertain you are about schedules and it avoids you just taking on risks um, uh, automatically. Okay. Um, there's some major risks associated with, uh, with estimation that we'll be talking about later in the class. One of the biggest risks is you'll ask, someone will ask you how long is something going to take and you give a range of dates and they take the first one is your, your promise. I'd like to talk though here um, about, and we'll talk about ways to avoid that uh, within later times, particularly the risk associated with giving a single point estimate. But let's talk about some stages and risks that I expect you to undertake for this class. One is identification of risks. Every deliverable, I expect to see a list of risks, top 10 risks. Those risks will evolve. Risk right now are often big ones with respect to technologies. Risk two months from now, when you have that technology learning belt under your, under your um, you know, past, under your belt and you, your technology learning curve um, is, has receded into the past, it'll be a different set of risks. Um, so you need to identify the risks. You, you basically say, how much does this matter? And that considers two things. What are two things it considers? We mentioned them early. Austin had mentioned some, and it came to mitigation. Severity. Severity, which is how bad it is if it occurs, and likelihood. yeah, the likelihood or probability that it occurs. So basically what you're doing is you're figuring out what's called risk exposure. And essentially it's a multiplication of those two. It's the most common way to treat it. Don't get so caught up on this. I mean, you don't have to have an exact probability, exact severity, but you want to at least distinguish things that are, you know, that are, that are reasonably highly likely to be bad from things that are low likely or things that absolutely must be dealt with. Then you figure out how to handle it. And the two most common ways that I, I will emphasize in this class is mitigation. You do something up front, contingency planning where you have a plan up front. 
You put in place a plan, so if something happens, then you take action. And then, on an ongoing basis, you'll be monitoring. On an ongoing basis, okay? Now, for risk identification, I mentioned before, today's risk is tomorrow's problem. If we don't act against them, they'll act against us. But today's problem is also tomorrow's risk, and you should be able to learn from processes, okay? Learn from the problems you encounter and head them off in the future. And uh, in this take, in this sense, at least once per deliverable, you should talk a little bit about what the risks are. Talk amongst each other. The, the person who takes ownership of risk management, who's the main person who's going to be doing risk management? Austin. So you should go around and you should talk with each person and find out what are their fears, what, what, are, what things do they think could really go wrong? Are there issues where they think the project could go off base? You know, maybe it's communication issues. Maybe it's issues with interaction with the stakeholder. Maybe it's concerns about the technology. And often people will have somewhat different perceptions of risk. So Mo is going to have a lot more contact probably with the details of the development system than, than for example, Will Jay um, or, or, or Will Jesse. So, so you're, you should go around and you should, should talk to people. Um, and and ask what what are what possible things could uh, could go wrong there are things that can go wrong that aren't the fault of any one person but rather a set of of different faults okay um and uh and you know what things could go wrong from each person's side okay um one way to do this is to describe a particular way which you know things could go really awry um, and you attach a probability and a loss estimate uh, for that, okay? The key thing I want you to be able to estimate to, to order this list is what's called the risk exposure. Here, I'd like to be able to estimate a probability something will occur and a loss if it does occur. Severity. You could feel free to do it from one to 10 for each of those. It's not asking for perfection. It's of questionable benefit to spend an extremely long time on this. Um, but give it an honest thought and roughly get it right so you can at least roughly order these risks. It's not a matter that your, your argument for these numbers has to hold up under great scrutiny. Maybe it's one off from the actual numbers. What matters is your rough prioritization of these risks. You know, should it be in your top 10, for example? Okay. Um, so I mentioned before the two key mechanisms, contingency planning and risk mitigation. For each of the top 10 risks, I expect you to have either a contingency plan or some sort of mitigation strategy. Mitigation lowers the chance it will occur or the, the severity if it does occur. And it's not necessarily money that's invested up front. It might be you put in time up front. You put in, um, you have resources like shadowing going on. Everyone shadows someone else in the project so that if that project, they sh the person they shadow goes, is unavailable because they got sick or they drop or they they are otherwise unavailable they can uh, the person who shadowed them will still need know a lot of what's what's needed to do the job um, so here the resources are invested on an ongoing basis you don't just have a plan of what to do if this comes about you have you actually have efforts being made to make it less harmful or less likely. Um, contingency planning, here you're actually putting in place a plan. Other than that, you're not really doing much. You have in place a plan um, to act quickly in a concerted, coordinated way if something happens. And you all agree to that. Um, and And you can undertake it. And this is very good if you can deal with it quickly. Once a plan's in place, if it's quick to undertake, that's excellent, okay? 
Um, by contrast, mitigation can be really good for things that are not feasible to deal with. Once it occurs, you're in bad straits because you don't have time to deal with it once it happens. The cat's out of the bag. You need a mitigation strategy to head that off. Contingency plans, great if you know the risk is only moderately likely and once it happens, you can undertake an action to really lessen its impact, great. Contingency planning is good. Mitigation is, is, uh, is if, if it takes a long time to fix. Okay, so, it's a good strategy. So I'll, I'll tell you that both of these are widely applied in industry. Uh, I know about one project that cost many billions of dollars that was saved from failure by an effective, an effective contingency plan, for example. Um, it and it ended up, uh, you know, saving years and years of work because they had that contingency plan. One software company that I ran, we were, we at a certain point had uh, a single client that was uh, a very uh, favorable contract, and we uh, we had a very good relationship with the president's office and that client. Um, they were a sponsor, a very high level executive sponsor of our work, support from the very top of the organization. It was a many hundreds of thousands of dollars project. But we put in place a contingency plan in our contract. It was a contingent contract. We had various possibilities. And one of the possibilities was in the event that the project is canceled, by the client, they would have to pay us close to $100,000, about 80000 And lo and behold, a lot of the way through the project, maybe two thirds of the way, the president suddenly changed there. I think the board deposed the old president, a new president was put in. They want to clear house. This is not uncommon in companies. New person comes in and says, I want to have new staff. I want to start with a fresh, fresh leaf, not, not have backbiting, not have the old team conspiring against me. So they, they got rid of everyone, got rid of the contracts, canceled our contract. We had a contract for, we had this clause in there for $80,000. They paid, kept the staff for, uh, alive for a long time, you know, for the better part of a year until new arrangements could be made. So this is an example of a contingency plan. Um, uh, and uh, if anyone's interested, I'd be glad to, to tell more detailed stories about ones that have, that have had even larger impact. So the key thing here is with mitigation and contingency to, to have some sort of an ongoing risk management. And there are certain things in software that we do that improve flexibility and allow us to lower our exposure to risk or react more closely. And one of them is we have shorter development iterations. What sort of risk does that help lower? Um, changes. Yeah. Changes associated with what, for example? Uh, software, uh, client needs. Um... Good. So changes in the library, changes in the software. We iterate and these changes can occur because we're always reprioritizing what to do next, for example. What to do next. Uh, so for example, changes in client need, we can decide, uh, okay, given the change in client need, what's the next priority? Whereas if we had planned it all out for a year, we would have been smacked in the face by this and it would have been a lot harder to change. If we're reevaluating things every two weeks, it's quite straightforward. Changes in technology too. We could say, oh, okay, you know, a new version of iOS came out. Um, do we want to go with this for the next generation? When do we want to roll this into our development processes, for example? Um, we can deal with essentially reprioritizing, replanning. Um, 
Another thing is um, building in place abstraction barriers. What's, what do I mean by this? More general abstraction barriers. Well, it turns out that if you have code that is articulated in a more general way, often you can change its functionality really easily compared if it's very hard coded. And here we might be able to put in place new functions, new mechanisms quite easily than if, if all things were hard coded at a lower level. Um, uh, use of more portable underlying technologies, use of something like React or something like Flutter um, might allow you, even if you're focusing initially on Android, to quickly go to iOS if required. Um, or you have minimization of platform dependencies. When I worked in the Excel project, there was a layer of Excel that basically dealt with platform specific issues. Above that layer, everything was in common. PC Excel, Mac Excel, it was all common code base. And that allowed us to very quickly implement a feature in Mac Excel and it would be automatically available over a PC Excel with, with minimal, minimal effort. Broad team skill sets. Compared to having a bunch of people who are very, very specialized in their area, why does it help to have people have broader skills within the team? Each person has a broad set of skills. Why does that help? The more knowledge spread around. Yeah, it can spread knowledge around. So if one person is hit by a bus or quits the project or is sick, the others can substitute, right? Um, Communication of skills within teams. If you could have people who teach about how React works within your team, you're in good shape. Because within that team, you you can end up you can end up having more resilience because more people understand how this area of the of the code base works. Um, now this sort of Risk management should be done on an ongoing basis. There's two things you're looking for. Are risks you identified earlier emerging or are new types of risks that you didn't anticipate earlier coming about? New types that weren't in your top 10 list, weren't at all being considered. Are they, they coming about? So maybe late in the game, you try integrating a new technology and that might bring in a new set of risks, okay? Um, and this should be an ongoing process um, that's part of your planning for each new deliverable. Um, there's a significant opportunity for risk management to get involved with estimation and figuring out are we behind, um, what's the risk in terms of uh, uh, that we won't deliver on time that can involve risk management, talk with development and testing and figuring out are we gonna be able to, uh, um, to, to sort of finish this off in time, okay? Um, so with incremental delivery, you're, you're going to want to engage in prioritization according to business value and risk. Why undertake risky things early? Because if they fail, then there's less loss. Yeah, there's less things to redo and also you have more time to redo them. Imagine if you take on a risk, a very risky thing two weeks before the end of the class and it fails. What chance do you have to use a different framework or, or approach? Not much, but if you do it early and that approach doesn't work out, not only do you have to throw less away often, but you have time to sort of find a viable solution even if it's not, not rolled out immediately, okay? Um, you can actually figure out how much do I promise for this next iteration based on your velocity, how much you've been producing to now. Um, and um, and you, know, you, you have this uh, less chance of things just being piled on at each, each two or three week stint, you ask, okay, what's next for our implementation rather than just having this growing, growing, growing set of features placed on for future implementation, okay? And in principle, you can rush to the delivery. You can give someone something, you know, that's that's reasonably um, uh, that's that's reasonably uh, com that's reasonably functional has at least some subset of the functionality. Um, okay. 
so I talked about that. Okay, uh, I think that's all for now for me. Um, risk management and testability. Please, please, please make good use of assertions, comments, good naming. Something else should be in here, big time. I don't know why this isn't, specifications. Here, what this code does and separating that out from, from all the gory details of how it does it in the code. You specify in a comment, you know, this function undertakes this job, this or its preconditions, postconditions. It helps for testing. It helps for understanding on the part of people using it, so they use it well. And then some of these hooks and, and stubs and mocks fakes. See if you can make use of them. Okay, so that's all for me. Any questions about that just while I pack up here, pack this up and transition to you? Okay, are you folks showing slides? Okay, so do you want to hitch up here? Do you need a few minutes to get ready? Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. I will go call my admin person and